Beautiful. Good morning. We invite you uh, to sing with us today uh, on this song. So as we sing, familiar song. It's a song of hope, and that's what we need. Hope. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the sky, and they tell me. from Habakkuk, I have the privilege to read about Habakkuk Complains. And that is from Habakkuk uh, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Lord, how long must I ask for help and you ignore me? I cried out to you about violence, but you do not save us. Why do you make me see wrong things and make me look at trouble? People are destroying things and hurting others in front of me. They are arguing and fighting, so the teachings are weak and justice never comes. Evil people gain while good people lose. The judges no longer make fair decisions. It kindly seems like this day and time too, doesn't it? But now in Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, the Lord answers. I will stand like a guard to watch and place myself at the tower, and I'll wait to see what God will say to me. I will wait to learn how God will answer my complaint. The Lord answered me. Write down the vision. Write it clearly on clay tablets so whoever reads it can run to tell others. It is not yet time for the message to come true, but that time is coming soon. The message will come true. 
It may seem like a long time, but be patient and wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not be delayed. The evil nation is very proud of itself. It is not living as it should, but those who are right with God will live by trusting in him. And that is so true. So the word of God, I, oh, the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. <laughs> Get nervous up here in front of everybody. I don't see how you do it every Sunday, Brother Larry. <laughs> My teaching is from the uh, Word of God, 2 Thessalonians, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and then verses 11 and 12 of the same chapter. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thess Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Then it, we go into final judgments and glory. We are bound to thank God if what, <clears throat> always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and your faith. In all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Then verse 11. Therefore we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of, the, of this calling. <laughs> and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with, with power that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and, that, and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Ending of the chapter. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning. Good morning. Let us stand together and read the Apostles' Creed, number 881. <laughs> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's remain standing and sing number 378, How Sweet the Sound, Amazing Grace. Saved a wretch 
consciousness I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The Lord has brought Good morning. God is good. And all the time. Don't, aren't you glad that the man who put all the stars in the skies knows your name? I'm thankful he knows mine. This morning for announcements, our Sunday school starts each Sunday at 10 a.m. Worship services at 11. An important announcement today. Pastor Larry would like everyone to stay after church this morning to talk about the disaffiliation process, our plans and role in the matter. Today is our fifth Sunday offering for the Methodist Children's Home. Uh, the offering envelopes are in the bulletin and back of the pew. The Upper Room and Good News Magazine for November and December are in the foyer. Uh, take them home with you. Uh, upper Room starts Tuesday, November the 1st. A big thank you to everyone who participated in the luncheon this past Sunday, whoever brought food, uh, helped clean up, helped get it ready. We were so thankful for each of you. Uh, we have a birthday this upcoming week. Miss Vanessa has a birthday this week. So let's sing happy birthday to Vanessa. Wednesday night Bible study, we have fellowship and food at 5.30. Bible study is at 6. Our Samaritan's Purse Christmas Child Project is coming up. You need to return your boxes on November the 13th. If you haven't got your boxes, we still have some up here. We see some have already been brought back, and we thank you for that. The details on how to pay, put the money in the boxes or on the boxes is listed in your bulletin. We have some November activities listed. The 13th is the Charge Conference, 3 p.m. at Community United Methodist Church in Prestonsburg. The 17th is the Pockville Ministerial Thanksgiving Service at 7 p.m. at the New Beginnings Fellowship Church in Pockville. And the 20th is our Community Thanksgiving Service and Fellowship Meal at 6 at the Mayflower Baptist Church. Any other announcements? Uh, I just want to clarify, that's Pike County uh, and Pikeville Ministerial Associate. Just want to make sure, because I make sure everybody knows it's the entire county is included on that. And I just wanted to say thank you to all the church 
that brought in all of those household items, the dishes and the beautiful towels and all of the things that were taken over to help with the families. And um, I think uh, this last Monday, or was it, anyway, they took them over. And uh, so there's some of the families that are displaced in some of those trailers, and then there's still more coming. So thank you all to our church for providing that need. This morning on our prayer list, we want to continue to remember Jerry Coleman. She has been moved to rehab. David Staten, Tony Wallen has been sent to UK. Larissa Ratliff, Jonathan Ford, he's scheduled for Thursday, a surgery visit. Tim Skidmore is scheduled for surgery on the 29th at UK. Continue to remember Debbie Penix, Charles Edmonds, the children suffering with RSV. Vanessa, as she lost her father. Lois, Avery, she has a fever. Continue to remember the family of Andrew Allen. And Ward Skidmore, Skidmore is in the hospital in West Virginia. Is there any spoken requests? If not, we'll ask our pastor to come lead us in prayer. Are there any unspoken prayer requests? God sees your hand and knows the need that it represents. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we take a moment this morning to just come before you and give you thanks and acknowledge your goodness. And we confess to you our sins and the things that we have done and the things that we have left undone. God, today we lift up those on our hearts and those on our prayer list. And Lord, we want to pray for these special prayer requests that were uh, listed and those that were mentioned this morning and even those, Lord, that were unspoken. God, we ask you to help with those that are getting ready to face surgery. Pray, Lord, for Tim and others, Lord, today. We just put this in your hands and pray for the family for strength. Uh, God, as they uh, are, we know it's hard not to worry. It's hard not to be concerned. And you've taught us to, uh, to give these things to you and help us to do that, Lord. And those that are facing, uh, Lord, challenges, uh, whether it be uh, financial challenges or, uh, God, loss of a loved one and, and complications from just hospital stays and God we just put this in your hands Lord you know you know what we're facing and God we know that you'll help us face it and we thank you Lord for your presence in our lives and times when life is was very difficult God you promised you'd never leave us and you'd never forsake us though sometimes our friends may forsake us, our family may forsake us. The writer of the psalm said, my father and mother may forsake me, but the Lord will take me up. And I'm thankful, Lord, that when we look around and we see all of our friends and loved ones not there, we can look behind us and see you're right there and you've been there all along. We thank you for that. We thank you for your blessings today. God, we pray for our church, and you, we pray you'd lead us in these difficult days. And sometimes, Lord, the most difficult days become the brighter days. And we pray, Lord, as you taught us, as you taught the disciples, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
And so this uh, is our fifth Sunday um, offering that we, we do, and we, we have a video that we'd like to show. Uh, one of the things that they're doing now is in the way of adoption and things. So if give uh, just a moment to get that going. We'll show the video. Your gifts bring families together through the Kentucky United Methodist Children's Homes Adoption Program. Our staff guide parents through the long, emotional process of adoption. In 33 years, we have helped place over 650 children with their forever families. Brianna and Alan adopted both of their sons with our program after a difficult journey to grow their family. Brianna says, as soon as our first son was placed in my arms, I knew our journey had led us to this little one. I would experience all the heartache 10 times over for these precious boys. Loving them and watching them grow is something I will forever be grateful for. We would have been so lost without the Methodist Children's Home. You make our ministry possible. You helped 923 youth and families find hope and healing last year. Thank you. Please give generously this fifth Sunday. So thank you for your uh, faithful giving to this ministry. And every fifth Sunday, we designate the Sunday for the children's home. And uh, it's a wonderful ministry. So uh, we're going to do our doxology. And uh, <clears throat> we're going to pray after that. Uh, Melinda, would you pray after we sing our doxology? Uh, we had got, I got an email from a chaplain at UPike uh, saying if any churches would be interested in joining UPike student holiday meal on Wednesday, November the 16th at 7.30. They're seeking churches to make home-cooked food and desserts and come and participate in a holiday meal with the students. Uh, they're going to have some games and different stuff. I've already heard from a couple churches uh, that are going to be participating in that. And if anyone would be interested in helping, uh, they're expecting about 150 students. It takes place on the seventh floor. Uh, and uh, they will provide drinks, plates, utensils, and advertising. Uh, and they want churches just to come and love the students. So uh, it'd be a great ministry. If someone feels led to kind of lead that, uh, let me know. All right. Uh -huh. Oh, 
service just for a very brief meeting on the uh, disaffiliation uh, process and maybe some good news on that front for a change. <laughs> uh, scripture reading is taken from Luke chapter 19. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. Let us pray. Father, we pray that we might have a hunger and a thirst for your word uh, of a manner similar to Zacchaeus, 
that we might be willing to endure uh, hardship or embarrassment, even if that would be uh, what it would take to do that. Bless our pastor now as he comes and opens the word to us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, I want you all to help me out here if you remember this song. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree, for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree. And he said, Zacchaeus, you come down from there. I'm going to your house today, for I'm going to your house today. Hey, Amen. Good job. Good job. Uh, I don't know why we always shout that. Zacchaeus, you, I don't think Jesus said it quite like that, but that's, that's the way we do it in the song. Uh, but... Uh, just a familiar song that most of us grew up in Sunday school, Bible school, and vacation Bible school uh, learning. Uh, and this is a story. Um, and so if you read the Gospel of Luke, uh, you will find that uh, there is a certain attitude toward certain group of people. And that is people, well, rich people. And I don't know why it is that, that Luke seemed to have this attitude, or maybe he thought Jesus had this attitude, but you find it over and over. Uh, that seems to be a running theme with Luke, that any time there's uh, something to do with riches, it's usually not good. And so when the Bible says to us that there was a certain man named Zacchaeus who was a tax collector, well, first of all, that's bad enough. Not just a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector. And, you know, a tax collector was one thing, but the chief tax collector, that's the one that didn't just sit in a booth and take taxes. He's the one that came to your house and took everything that you owned, basically. They weren't people with good reputations, in other words. They, they were not known to be good people, and so they had a bad reputation. But, at the same time, he's the chief, so he is somebody uh, in society. Uh, but if that wasn't bad enough, he says, and he was rich. Ooh. So it gets even worse, you see. Uh, he, was, he was a tax collector, the chief tax collector, but that ain't, it doesn't stop there. He, he was rich. So he wasn't liked by a lot of people, and probably because some of the ways he got rich was by defrauding and taking advantage of the poor. And so here you have this passage, and, and uh, Jesus, of all people, uh, to invite yourself to their home, uh, invites himself to the home of a guy, first of all, who just climbed a tree. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, here's this fellow that you would imagine, thinking about you know, someone who would be a little prestigious, if you would, and Jesus comes to town, and, and because of his stature, I guess. He decides he wants to get a look at Jesus. We don't know exactly why, but here he is up in a tree. He's kind of out on a limb, and Jesus sees him, and he sees Jesus. And this is where the story begins. And as Jesus is saying, I'm going to come and dine with you today uh, because he's a good guy? No. Uh, the crowd doesn't seem to think so anyway. They start to grumble. And when Jesus makes this announcement, oh, you know, they're like, why are you going to his house? Don't you know he is a sinner? And you can put that uh, on any, you can add anything to that if you want. A drunkard, a gambler, whatever. They're like, why would he do this? Why would he just lower himself to this man's standards? And I guess Jesus could sing along with Garth Brooks, I've got friends in low places, because he seemed to have that as well. And so I want to point out some things today that I think are important for us to know uh, that I see in this passage. And the first one is this. There are a lot of people who feel that they are unacceptable to God. Now they may not say that, and they may not even understand it completely because I can tell you there have been times in my life when I have felt that way, even after becoming a Christian. But where they feel they are unacceptable to God. And 
This story tells us that is not the case. There are people who, <clears throat> who come to church every Sunday and yet they don't really get involved because they don't feel like they're worthy enough, that they're smart enough, that they can pray good enough, that they can read good enough, whatever, and they don't get involved because they, they don't feel like they're worthy. And maybe there are some who come and feel like, I don't want people to know the real me because I'm not as Christian as they are. And there are people outside these walls today that may not come into the building because they feel like they are unacceptable to God. And sadly to say, some of us have made them feel that way. And so if you think about it, there's uh, understand about 52% of Americans who no longer attend church. That's one of the things. And, and, and there can be various reasons for that, but at least some of the reasons that we hear is people don't feel welcomed in the church. And you think about the fact that we may sometimes feel that way, and it's never God saying it. It's not that Jesus is saying, I don't want to hang out with you, because He does. In fact, wherever Jesus was, there were always those people that the society had rejected. Those were the people that He hung out with. In the early days of the AIDS crisis, you all remember when it first started, we didn't know a whole lot about it. There's a story from a Reverend Ted Karp that he was serving as an Episcopal priest in a church in Texas. And one evening a man showed up at his door. And when he did, he could clearly see the, uh, the marks uh, from someone who had AIDS. And this man said to him simply, Pastor, would you allow me to come to your church and to die in your church? You see, this man had been to six churches already that day and had been turned down by all six pastors. And to be honest, Pastor Ted was a little bit reluctant too. Because as I said, there was not a lot known about AIDS at that time. And a lot of people, there was a lot of fear and hatred going around. People had lost their jobs. People had been kicked out of churches. All kinds of things was happening. And he was a little reluctant. But then he thought about the fact how Jesus treated the lepers. And now he touched the lepers and how he loved them. And he said to that man, he said, Yes, you can come to our church and I'll stand by you. And so he did come to that church. But... What the pastor didn't know, that he had a plan at that time, that he was just going to come to that church and he eventually was going to take his life, probably in that church. But the pastor's acceptance and love was so overwhelming to him that he changed his mind. Unfortunately, not everybody in the church had the same attitude. Their attendance began to dwindle. And they just kept going down and down to finally, they got down to about 21 members in this large church. But you know what? These 21 people committed to loving this man, and they loved him all the way until his death. And when he died, he died knowing that there was a group of people that loved him. That's the kind of thing that I think that Jesus would have us to understand today, that God's love does not stop because of certain conditions of certain people. God's love is everywhere. I want to give you a a modern parable today that, uh, to help maybe make us understand this story. I call it the parable of the prodigal dog. Okay? You know, there was once a man that had two dogs. One was named Toby and one was named Ralphie. And uh, Toby was the perfect dog. Toby was this black lab, and he was just the perfect dog. He did everything that you asked him to, and always wanted to please his master. Was always looking with eyes of love on anything, and if you said that you were disappointed with him, it just broke his heart. Ralphie was a little different. Ralphie kind of marched to the beat of his own drum. He didn't care what you thought. He didn't care what you said. He was going to do his own thing. But his master loved Ralphie and did want him to get out. And so he did everything in his power to make sure that the fence and everything was secure so he wouldn't get out and go uh, and get hurt. But one day, Ralphie found a way and decided against all odds that he was going to go anyway. 
And he went out into the mountains, and he went into a far country, and he spent all his time just doing all kinds of stuff out there, and spent time after time, and hour after hour, in the heat of the sun, looking for God knows what, but would not come home. But the father was worried about his son, his little dog, and he went out and looked for him, and he searched, and he stood on the porch, and he cried after him, but... No Ralphie. So finally, Ralphie was at the point where he was getting very, very thirsty and hungry. And he's thinking to himself, boy, I sure am hungry. I sure am thirsty. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do because there's no water around here. I'm on a mountain. and Oh, yeah. I remember back home there's all kinds of water. It seems like an endless flow and there's tons of food. And I'll just go back there and, and I'll, I'll just go in and just make myself at home. But then he thought... But wait a minute, they're going to be very angry at me because I've not been a good little dog. You know, I may just, I, I may, they may not accept me anymore. He thought, well, maybe I could do this. Maybe if I go back and I say, I'll just be like the other dogs that sleep outside and you can put me out on the porch or in the doghouse and I'll do that, then maybe they will accept me. I know I'll never get to sleep in that king size bed anymore, but maybe I can sleep outside or on the couch or something. And, and so that's what Ralphie decides to do. And so he goes home, and the father's standing there waiting, and he kind of walks in the door and has his head bowed and just knowing that he's going to get scolded. And instead, that's not what happened. Instead, the master picks him up and grabs him and says, So glad you're home. I love you. And he kissed him, and Ralphie's thinking, what are you doing? I don't deserve this. I'm, I'm not worth it. And the master says, oh, yes, you're so worth it to me. You're so worth it to me. And I think about so many people that are outside these walls today that feel like they're not worth it, that feel like the church has abandoned them, that nobody seems to care. And it's not that, you know, some people say, well, you know, it's not that my theology's changed. I want to tell you my heart, God changed my heart a few years ago, and I had the same kind of contempt for people that were different from now. If it was a different religion or whatever, I had the same kind of disdain for people. And God began to work on my heart, and somehow I began to put myself in their shoes and to see what they go through, and my heart changed. My theology hasn't, but my heart has changed. And I want you to know that if you feel like you're unacceptable to God, I don't care what you've done or who you are or where you're from, God loves you. And He sent His Son to die on the cross for your sins. And that's the message today that I see in this, is that God wants to love you and wants you to come home. That's all He wants. The second thing I want to say today is, is kind of a continuation of that. And it's simply this, God loves you anyway. I want, to, I want you to say that with me. God loves you anyway. No matter what you've done today, God loves you anyway. Uh, look at the passage. Verse 5 starts with this. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, you come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and they began to mutter, He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Now Jesus uses this moment to show love to the least popular guy in the crowd, the most hated guy among them, because Jesus never passed up a chance to show the heart of God. So no matter how unacceptable we are or may feel, God loves us anyway. Remember that. Verse 8 says, But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look here, now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. First of all, he's not owning up that he did cheat. He said, if I did. But he says, I'm going to give all my possessions. I'm going to do all this. Jesus didn't ask him to do any of that. Jesus didn't say, okay, you come down from there, and if you give up your possessions and you do all this, then I'll accept you. He just decides, man, this guy is worth it. I'm going to do this. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And that brings me to my final point today from this story. 
And I'm just going to borrow Jesus' very words for this point. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Let me say that again. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Please memorize these words. Inscribe them on your heart and in your brain. And write them if you want. You can put it over your mirror so when you get ready that you'll remember this. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. You know, we need both of these verbs to understand the heart of God. We need both of these verbs. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save. What if it said, the Son of Man came to seek the lost? Well, it would be easy for us to misunderstand God's character and purpose. We might believe that Jesus seeks the lost so He can correct them or condemn them or stand in judgment of them or point and preach to them a hellfire and brimstone message. But that's not what it says. Or what if the verse read, for the Son of Man came to save the lost? That's a little better. But it still doesn't show us God's character and purpose. We could still twist Jesus' word to mean that if the lost comes into our church, and if they act like one of us, and if they do what we say, and if they fit into our mold, then and only then will Jesus save them. That's not what it says. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And that's what it meant. That's exactly what He did, and that's exactly what He wants us to do. He wants us to seek and to help Him save the lost. A few years ago I was hired by this church to be the full-time pastor. I was, it's been June, it'll be 11 years. And when I came to this church I remember uh, going into my uh, office that I had downstairs in the basement and waiting for people to come to me. And guess what? <laughs> Nobody did. And I sat there, you know, I'd study my sermons and all that, but there was nobody showing up. And finally I decided, okay, I'm going to go to them. <laughs> and I went to the hospital and I signed up as a volunteer chaplain. And I began to volunteer as a chaplain. Of course, today I'm full time chaplain. But to think about the fact that there are people in that hospital that I've met in these uh, almost 10 years at the hospital that I've seen life after life change. And I'm not taking any credit for it because God is the one that changes lives. But there were people, so many people that I came in contact with that were, that were needing just somebody to tell them, hey, God loves you. God loves you. And you can have a relationship with God. And so many lives I've seen, we've been able to baptize so many people and see lives change and tell people the message of the gospel. Because we know that that is the ministry that Jesus, Jesus gave us a ministry. He didn't say, you know, uh, for everyone to come, but He said for us to go. And that's what we're to do. That's why some of you do what you do in and, and the ministries that you are and the different jobs that, you know, we're not all pastors, but we can all do something. And that was Jesus' ministry. So please don't believe the lie that you're unacceptable to God. Uh, one of the greatest truths that Jesus came to teach us is that God loves you anyway. No matter what your feelings say, no matter what others say, no matter whether you deserve it or not, God loves you anyway. And the whole reason God became flesh in the form of Jesus was so the Son of Man could come to seek and to save the lost. And you know, I, I believe this, if you're looking for Jesus, He's looking for you. And if you're not looking for Jesus, He's still looking for you. And He's wanting a relationship with you. And if you have received God through the love of Jesus Christ, there are others out there that are looking for you to tell them about a God who loved them enough that He would come and die on an old rugged cross for their sins. I want to ask you this morning to bow your heads as the musicians come. Dear God, I don't deserve the love You give us. And yet, Lord, You love us anyway. And I'm so thankful for that today. God, help us to see others through the lens of Christ. People who need the Lord. 
and help us to offer that same kind of love and acceptance. God, it's not our job to judge. It's our job to love. And I pray, Father, for you to just fill our church with the kind of love that would just spill out into our community. That others might say, hey, there's a church down the road that will love you. Forgive us of our sins, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing number 347, the Spirit Song. you today. Go in peace knowing that God loves you and that you do matter to God and that there are people out there who want to hear that they matter to God. May the Lord bless you. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Let's stand and sing the first verse of number 664 sent forth by God's blessing.